I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria. I came from a close-knit family, even though I came from a poor family. But they gave me education with the instruction that this is the tool that will help me to dig my way out of poverty and ignorance. I came without a dime in my pocket. All I had were big dreams, determination to succeed, and the resilience. So coming from another country gave me that insight to be able to understand and deal with people from different backgrounds. I was walking into Kroger to pick up a prescription for my mom. Upon approaching the pharmacy, I slipped and fell in some liquid. I went to see my regular doctor, and that is when I knew that there was more going on from that fall. I then called Mr. Alawali, talked to him and let him know what was going on. I could just say that he, he's very professional and knowledgeable about what he does. He's very passionate about what he does, and he cares about his clients. I felt like I was a part of the Alawali family. The goal is to make sure that our clients will leave feeling that someone gets them knowing that someone was able to be the voice for them. We needed an attorney because we needed somebody who understood the relationship between our case and the law. We had been through four different lawyers. We were very desperate. We knew from what we had heard that Emmanuel Alawali was the man, you know, who could take us through that experience and see us through and give us the kind of outcome we were looking for. For him, your case is personal. He gave us hope, he gave us encouragement, and we knew that we had found the right man that would see us through. Just know that when you're coming through the door, you're coming in through a place where you will be accepted and welcome as family, where you'll be seen as a person. At the Olawale Law Firm, we get you. We understand you. Trust us. Welcome to this episode of Legal Angle with Emmanuel De La Olawale. My guest today is a professional artist. She's also a judicial assistant with the Franklin County Municipal Court. Her name is Tiffany Lawson. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Which is, this um this podcast that you have it 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 is very much a great vehicle um so, uh, to gain information. I appreciate you for having me. Oh, thank you. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself? Who is Tiffany? <clears throat> well, I am a Columbus native. I've I've born and raised here on the South Side. Um, I graduated from South High School. Um, very much a South Side girl or woman, I should say. Um, from there, I went to Ohio State where I got a degree in mass communications. Um, and I've been with the municipal court, uh, I just passed 18 years this, uh, this past November. So it's, it's been, um, it's been full circle. It's, it's, it's interesting to, uh, I work on the 12th floor. It's interesting to look out of the windows at the courthouse and I can see each 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 place that I've been. So it's 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 really a blessing. Thank you. What was it like growing up in the south side of Columbus? It was wonderful, to tell you the truth. Um, it's definitely not what it is right now um, as gentrification has swept through. But um, growing up on the south side, it was very much a, a tight knit uh, neighborhood community. Um, there was pharmacies, there were laundromats. It was very thriving uh, economy on its own. Um, but like I said, it's, it's not the same. And that is definitely one of the things that um, I, I kind of talk about with my art as well. What was your home life like? Uh, lots of uh, music, uh, lots of reading. Uh, we did a lot. We were, we were required, my brother and sister and I, um, to always read, um, which is, is something that you know, can give you access to just everything that you could get your hands on. Uh, we 
visits to the library. Uh, mom and dad were both uh, college graduates. Um, so education was a big deal in our household. And for me, that just, it fed my creativity. Um, and also you'll see that in my work as well. I do a lot of research as well before I start a piece. What was high school like for you? High school, I was a two sport athlete. I played volleyball and I ran track. Um, I was in the band. I played the flute for four years and I actually was pretty good at the flute. I went to state a couple state competitions and got some superior awards. Um, something that I'd like to go back and pick up. And hopefully it's like riding a bike. It's not too hard for me to wrap my mind back around music. But, um, yeah, so high school for me was, was, was amazing. And I ended up graduating top of my class and I got a full ride to Ohio State. So that's how I ended up at OSU. Oh, that's awesome. And you started off scribbling behind couches and the walls. Most that's definitely. Tell Most us definitely. about that. Um, so my favorite place to draw was in the end tables, like the drawers and the end tables at, that, at home. Um, so because I could slide it back in and mom wouldn't know until she went and, you know, to get something out of the drawer. But yeah, for the most part, I scribble on the wall behind the couches, uh, in closets. So uh, luckily, mom has had <laughs> a couple paint jobs since little. So those masterpieces are still on those walls, though. Oh, <laughs> yeah. what were you scribbling? What were they like? Oh, I would imagine they were people because I've, I've always drawn, you know, faces and things like that. Um, I remember specifically, you know, in kindergarten when you're learning your ABCs, like, you know, I practice my my writing on the wall. So just anything but paper. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure mom, it drove my mother crazy, but she never uh, she never um, discouraged that creativity, though. The wall was your canvas. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Okay. So did your, you say you drove your mom crazy. Did she try to stop you or did she just? No, she was you? very encouraging to tell you the truth. It wasn't something that, um, I can't say that I get, didn't get corrected because absolutely like, you know, instead of drawing on the wall, um, you know, and as I got older, you know, I stopped doing that. So it became, you know, art programs and, um, things like that. So she always kept me busy in the arts. So she encouraged your creativity. Absolutely. And then, you know, did she get you to go to a camp across the street? I did. Uh, so my mother ran a, um, a program from the church across the street from our house. Um, and it was a arts program um, that brought in local artists. And it was it wasn't just for me. Um, it was also the kids in the neighborhood. So my mom, my mom is very well known on the South side, but um, she ran that arts program. It was called Spirituality Plus through the church. So it was art, it was um, life skills. Um, and so we also, we had a group in that, um, the group name at the church was the Bay Bay Squad. So we were actually involved in um, art shows locally. Um, and there was a resident artist there. Her name was Gilda Edwards. She was very much my early mentor. Um, so I credit, I credit a lot of my, I guess, cultivating my creativity to that, those programs and also uh, art programs through the recreation centers. Um, so it's just always been a part of my life. And my, like I said, my mother did a very good job at cultivating and encouraging um, my, my creativity. Was there a particular moment that you realized that, yes, I'm an artist? Um, it's always, it's just always been a part of me. Like I've always, I've always been a, a creator, always doing something with my hands. Um, if I read a book, I, I, I've always been able to kind of adapt it into a piece of art. Um, and then like growing up, uh, in a lot of those programs, I realized very quickly that my work would go missing, you know, after the show and, and or even when I was at Ohio State and I was taking art classes for some reason, 
my work back. So somebody out there has been collecting my work for a very long time. So I think in those instances, um, I realized that I had something special um, and, and definitely wanted to continue to um, develop. Okay. Especially so with the style as well. Style. Okay. So do you have like people who inspired you into the type of, you know, the type of art you decide to, to make? Absolutely. So, of course, there's there's a ton of local influence in my artwork um, from uh, Amina Robinson and Grandpa Smokey Brown, um, both of which I met through the art program at the church um, and, you know, just several local artists, of course. But other than that, there are uh, other influences or inspirations like Gustav Klimt, um, Picasso. You'll see a little bit of that influence in my work, depending on what I, what the piece is about. Okay. And when you decided to go to college, because it seems you've known that you are creative since you were little, it's like breathing to you. But mm -hmm. instead of going for you know, majoring in art, you majored in mass communication. Why that? Well, um, unfortunately, they, they, they tell you that it's hard to be an artist. You know, it, it is quite a hustle. Um, and, it, and, you know, the whole idea of the starving artist. Um, so that's most definitely something I, I took cl art classes, but it wasn't something that I felt like um, I could necessarily fall back on if I majored just in art. So I chose mass communications. I started off a business major um, and then I went from business to journalism. And then from journalism, I settled into the mass communications um, degree. Mm -hmm. But the kind of the classes you took in college, did they encourage you or did they inspire you to become more creative? The art classes or the 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 communications courses? The art classes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I took basic drawing, so I was able to sharpen those skills um, and, and just continue to develop. So I took, I think I took maybe, I took an art class every quarter. Um, I probably could have minored, uh, but I, I didn't, so. And after you graduated college, you started working at the courthouse. Yes. How did you land that job? Uh, I had I had actually taken several interviews nationally trying to get a job in communications, which at the time were typically sales positions, um, and they were all commission-based, and I'm not... I don't I wasn't I wasn't confident that I could thrive in that in that way. So there was an opening um, with the court. I applied. I interviewed with 15 judges. It was like a roundtable fire starter type of interview situation. And I was hired in that that November after I graduated. Well, wow, you've been there ever since. Yes. Yeah. What do you do as a judicial assistant? Um, uh, I type. Uh, um, entries, court entries. I file entries um, every now and then. I'll pull. I pull dockets. Um, so it, it's um, secretarial in nature, answering phones, uh, things like that. Yeah. And you get to hear about people's cases. Absolutely. Um, provide information when people call and want to know about their cases, um, and and at least try to advise or suggest um, what their next step should be. Yes. Having that front seat view to the legal system and also being an artist, how, how do they intersect? Well, um, there's things about the court that from the inside um, are problematic. Um, and, and so I, I, I have, in some instances, used my, my work, my art, as a vehicle to try to um, address those, those, those problematic issues within the court. Does your judicial work, okay, let me put it this way. Does your judicial work inspire your creativity in any way? Or do we see any of your, some of the things you learn at the courthouse coming out, showing up in your work? You, Yeah, from time to time, bits and pieces. Um, but I will say, for me, my work is also a way for me to cope with 
um, being at the courthouse. Like I said, there are there are a plethora of things within the justice system that are problematic. So in with me processing those things and, and actually having been with the court for 18 years, it does help me to, um, I guess, navigate, you know, my own emotions um, or, or feelings about the court system. Yeah, because the court system can evoke emotions. Absolutely. Sometimes Absolutely. they are not pleasant emotions. Absolutely. So you use the work to cope with those emotions. Absolutely. There's there are inequities within the justice system. Um, there are most definitely um, lack of uh, ju justice in general. Like some people just are on the wrong side. Um, and in a, in a lot of ways, I feel like the municipal court is is a poor people's court. Um, there there are very much poor people crimes, and it's a cycle that people get into and can't get out. So unfortunately, in the 18 years that I've been there, it's, it's generally the same people um, charged with generally the same offenses um, with the same general outcomes. So it very much is something that I, I am looking forward to addressing more um, as I um, do do more work. Hmm. So it's a revolving door of poor people in the same Absolutely. cycle of justice and injustice, just Absolutely. year in, year out. Absolutely. You also have a certif certificate in art therapy mm -hmm. and life coaching. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, art there art is therapy, basically. Um, it's it's a it's a great outlet. It's a great way to process um, just life in general. So um, I received the I, I got the certificate while we were out for COVID um, with the with the um, intention to use it to help people kind of process their, their selves, their way out of the feelings uh, caused by the pandemic. So um, it's definitely it's definitely a uh, mechanism to cope. Have you used it with people? Um, I'm right, well, more recently, um, I've been using it with children. I did um, a summer camp, uh, or actually this spring, it wasn't this summer, uh, with um, elementary school kids first, and then I did some work at Arts Impact with some uh, middle schoolers. So it, it's most definitely interesting on that end to see, to ask a child, I don't know, you know, how often they may or may not, but to ask a child, how are you today? And can you, can you make a picture that tells me how you feel? Or uh, what do you like about yourself? Um, things like that, I think, are very important, especially as we emerge from the pandemic. Thank you. When people think think of art, they think of perfection. Mm -hmm. Is that you know, is that a myth, or is it how does it work? I think that is unfortunately one of the um, misnomers of that they kind of paint put in your head when you go to art school. The whole uh, that it has to be perfect. Um, so I kind of operate operate on the under the aesthetic wabi sabi, which is a Japanese aesthetic um, that focuses on imperfections and impermanence and how much beauty there is in those things. So can you elaborate how does the imperf imperfections and the Im impermanence of life bring about the beauty in the creative process? Well, um, especially in life, uh, change is inevitable. There's nothing you can do. Things things are going to evolve and, and people evolve. People come and go out of your life. Come and go out of your life. There's a there's a real ebb and flow um, between, you know, change in life. It, it, it you can't hold on to anything forever. So in terms of my creativity, um, it just it just has helped me. It is it it is so freeing for me to be able to understand that it doesn't have to be perfect, or I can change it if I don't like it. Um, it, it it is very difficult. I don't think a lot of people understand to to have a stark white canvas um, and to have to make the first mark. Like it, it it evokes a sense of like, am I doing this right? So to take that away with that with that aesthetic. It, it, it frees my creativity and allows me to kind of soar. In your creative process, 
you know, you said, you know, making the first dot or the first line. When do you decide that, you know what, this work is done? That's the tough part. I think I think for an artist, um, you have to first understand what your style is. You know what I mean? What it is that you do, what it is that or, or even just focusing on the end result, um, which is hard to get there. Uh, so the whole completion, I think that you can put yourself in. I just think if you, in my, in my creativity, I just allow it to flow. And then there's a, there's a, a point when I've had, it's enough. Thank you. And, you know, as a writer, I can relate to this, you know, um, I often say it's easier to criticize than to create. So, of course, your work will get criticized. Absolutely. How do you feel when people can even make up a straight line, criticize yeah. your work? Right. Um, it's, this, it's just part of art. Uh, you know, you'll make a work that is the most magnificent thing in the world and, and somebody else can't relate to it at all. So, I mean, it's just, that's, that's just part of it. You got, you have to accept it. And just like, you know, we were talking before, like it's, it, it's inevitable. That is one of those imperfections. That's one, some of that uh, impermanence. So you just have to accept it and, and grow and adapt and use, use the criticism to evolve whatever, whatever comes next. So you have to apply it. Hmm. It's all about evolution. Absolutely. So can you tell us how you evolved from being an amateur artist to being a professional? Sure. So I've been in 22 shows um, and I did that by uh, accepting rejection, which is tough. So I can't tell you how many no's I got before I got my first show, um, but it, it is definitely something that I was committed to. Um, and I think that commitment and dedication, I think you can see that in my work. But it, it is most definitely the most driving force um, to me getting to where I am. Wow. You didn't give up on those rejections. You just keep knocking on the doors. Right. Yeah. How did you feel through each rejection? Um, what you can't do is take it personal. Because um, it's, not, it's not a reflection of who you are as a person. You know what I mean? Or, or what, you're, what you stand for. You know, it, it is very much in relation to your 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 evolution and start thinking about it. So instead of looking at it as a reject rejection, I started considering, you know, from piece to piece what the what the common denominator was. And I was able to develop through that through that I was able to develop my own style. Did the rejection also help you to get better at what you do? Absolutely. Um, it's like I said, you have to, with any skill or any talent, um, there's there's the God-given part, and then there's the work that you have to do. So with that dedication and commitment to the work that is required of me, um, I think I think that's basically what what drives me. Yeah. What was that first yes like? How did you feel? Oh, it was wonderful. Um, it just made me, because after you get all those no's, you know, you, you continue, well, I continue to submit work. Um, and it, with the sense, in a way, you know, you, you get knocked down, but you got to get back up. So that first yes was like confirmation. Uh, like I am where I'm supposed to be doing what I'm supposed to do. So it most definitely was uh, was a confirmation, affirmation type of thing. Was that at the Milwaukee studio in 2014? Uh, yes. Yes, that was my first show. And what was that like? So with, with showing your work, you also have to learn how to talk about it. Um, that's a, that's the other portion of being an artist. So if you don't have the language to speak about your work, then, you know, it doesn't really have legs. You can't, you can't sell it to anybody. You definitely can't continue to show it if you can't speak about it. So that first show as a novice, uh, I wasn't very good at that. Uh, cause it, it, in, in, I'm a bit of an introvert, <laughs> Um, but you definitely have to come out of that box 
uh, as an artist to succeed. So your training as a mass communicator eventually intersect with your work as an artist. Absolutely. Absolutely. And do you still write? From time to time. Um, I do write because submissions, that's another part of uh, submitting your artwork. You have to be able to write about it as well as speak about it. So I do write submission narratives. Um, and, and I think the better you get at that, the more shows that you get accepted in. So, and sometimes with, with some of my pieces, there is, um, there's narratives that go with those two. Um, I guess I could maybe even call them poems, uh, but I don't write, I just write for fun, but other than the submission narratives. Just free write. Mm -hmm. okay. And you, you are the first artist to be selected uh, for the Columbus Cultural Arts Residency in 2021, mm -hmm. just after the lockdown right after the lockdown. It was such a blessing. Um, I don't remember how I found out about it, but I think I just saw it on the website and applied. Again, one of those things that I had to make sure that I wrote well um, to explain what I expected and to explain what my work is. Um, and they they welcomed me with open arms and it was a great, last summer was great. I had a great time. It was five, a five month residency um, and I had an exhibition at the end. Yeah. What was it like to be the first person, the trailblazer? <laughs> Thanks. Um, it was, it, I didn't know what to expect. So I walked in there um, and they didn't either. It was the first time they had ever done it. So I walked in very much knowing that I was, I was blazing a path for the next person. Um, so I just, I just um, let it flow. How do you just, yeah. So how do you accept the fact that you're now an historical figure? <laughs> um, I don't think it I don't think I have really grasped that in 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 reality. Um, but I accept it and I, and I do hope that uh, the the things that I did while I was there um, leave a lasting impact. Absolutely. Yeah. And what was that five months like, you know, for people like us who don't know what residency mm -hmm. feels or looks like? Can mm -hmm. you just give us an sure. insight? I had access to all the studios that are at the Cultural Arts Center. There's a sculpture studio. Of course, there's drawing studios. Um, there's weaving. And so I had access to the whole building. Um, so I chose to take printmaking and bronze casting, which I'm still doing now. I took to that very well. So other than that, I had a huge studio space there that they afford you when you um, are awarded the residency um, and just access to the instructors and their, you know, input or criticism as well um, in regards to what I was doing. But that was walking in there and I, I understand that my artwork doesn't really look like, um, it's not, it doesn't really look like something that they were used to. Like it wasn't pastels, it wasn't pencil, it wasn't, um, you know, ceramics. It was, it's very much my own. Um, so initially it was kind of awkward for them to come into my studio and see what I was working on. Um, and it wasn't something that they had seen before. So I had to deal with that at first, but I think they got used to me. And, and I think I even wowed them when I hung my exhibition. What, you know, how did you develop your unique style? Well, I'm definitely not a flat thinker. Um, some of my pieces are flat, um, but I tend to make things that are, are, are multidimensional. Um, so that's definitely something that I have adapted to as my own. Um, and very much the things that I research um, and also the style that I choose to make a piece with are very much inspired by research. So I have a piece called The Fruit Bearer um, that was inspired by Gustav Klimt's The Kiss. So when I when I give you that background, you can I think it helps a, a person view that work better. So there's always a general a general starting pl place like that. So that's that's generally what it is. How easy or difficult was it for you to get them to understand your work since it was unique? Well, 
I didn't really focus on um, trying to make them understand what I was doing. I just did it. I was in the moment. Um, and, and that's also something that you have to do when you're an artist. You have to accept what you're doing. You have to have confidence in what you're doing. So instead of taking the critiques or the awkwardness and, and turning it inward and asking myself if, if I'm doing it right, I just continue to do me. And, and it worked. It works that way. You just do you. You just do what you feel right, what you feel led to do. To do. Mm -hmm. In your creative process, do you have this instinct or intuition? Uh, how does it work? <laughs> yeah, well, it's 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 not me. Uh, I will say that I'm very intuitive. So a lot of times I'll start with a Bible verse. Um, and go from there and just allow allow the spirit to flow through me and with me. So and, and even I can say in relation to when a piece is complete, I'll say it's very intuitive in that way as well. So you feel more like a channel and a vessel just bringing out the creative work or the creative energy within the universe. Absolutely. And hopefully when you view my work, you can feel that. And it heals you and it or or even allows you to consider your own place, um, you know, your own place in the world and what you what you what you want to be able to commit and dedicate yourself enough to um, succeed or to achieve it. So how did you develop that influence of culture, spirituality and your humanity and the fact that you're a woman? How did you develop that? creative process. It's all God's grace. Um, I just am, like you said, a vessel and I allow him to use me and, and, and I, I, I take pride in that. And it's something that I protect and hold dear. So, um, cause it all flows together. It all flows together. What are those anchor messages behind, behind your work? So it's grace, mercy, Comfort, joy, peace, but the greatest is love. And I, I believe um, if we all focus on our own imperfections and learn to love ours, um, it would afford us a, a better way to love others. Grace, mercy, comfort, and the greatest of them is love. Yes. Tell us about grace and mercy. Grace and Mercy is actually a piece uh, that I worked on uh, right before the pandemic uh, shut everything down. Um, and it's just been actually shown for the first, it was shown for the first time at the OSU Faculty Club. And it's currently at the Bexley Library uh, through the end of August. Um, but it, it very much is, is an ebb and flow. As you give grace, you receive mercy and vice versa. And that's not just for yourself, well, it's it's more so for others. So I just believe that that is definitely something that we, we could all focus on um, in regards to humanity to make things more just, I could say. How about comfort and peace? Comfort and peace, comfort and joy, and then peace. So comfort and joy, I think you could, you don't, you don't have comfort and joy until you have grace and mercy. Because on the other side of that is comfort and joy. So it's definitely, I uh, actually, this is a series. I haven't really been able to get into comfort um, because for a long time, you know, during the lockdown months of the pandemic, I wasn't really comfortable. So hopefully as, you know, things, as we emerge, as things open back up, I can get back into comfort to finish the series com with comfort and joy. And peace and love. And peace and love. So that's something I think um, for eternity, that's something that uh, is definitely needed. Uh, peace is hard to, um, I guess, achieve in a way, but it all goes back to grace, mercy, comfort, and joy. So all those things can make you peaceful. So I, all these things merge together. You're all connected. Mm -hmm. yeah, as an artist, you know, uh, during the lockdown, it, it, well, a lot of people find that time to 
either work on their creativities or some just, you know, with, with some it was difficult. Mm -hmm. What was it like for you? Um, there were two ways I felt about it. So in the beginning, you know, I, I live alone. Uh, so there was quite a bit of solitude, um, which I enjoy. Um, but not being able to leave made that completely different. Um, so there was there were times when I, I kind of felt locked in. And I mean, that's I guess that's probably how a lot of people felt. But the silver lining for me was that I was able to see what it was like to do art 24 hours. Like with, without having to go to work, um, without having to put things aside. So it gave me an opportunity to see what that would look like, if, you know, once I retire. And it, it and I, I'm so thankful for it. I don't think that I would have been able to um, excel in the residency at the Cultural Arts Center without it. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. So I was going to ask did that time assist you in getting that residency? Because mm -hmm. obviously when you have time to dedicate to your work, you get mm -hmm. better. I ended up uh, through the through the lockdown, I, I had a an exhibit coming up at 934 Gallery. So it gave me the opportunity to, you know, laser in on those pieces and figure out exactly what I was trying to say. Um, and that was that was right. Um, right after one of the unfortunate police shootings. So I was able to kind of process through that as well. Um, and so the pieces that I showed at 934 are in relation to those events. So um, absolutely, it just fed right in and, and God allowed those things to line right up. So I went from, I went, you know, we got locked in and my exhibition got pushed back but during the lockdown, I was able to do all that work and be ready for that exhibition. And then from there, move into the residency. So I had a, I had a body of work that I could use to apply for the residency that made me eligible for the residency. It was a time for preparation. Absolutely. I felt I just... like God had set me aside. He gave me, he, he opened the doors and laid the path. I just had to, I just had to commit and dedicate to what I was doing. And that was like your wilderness moment while you were getting ready. Mm -hmm. Then after that wilderness moment, you just mm -hmm. shined. Absolutely. That was the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And with your work, you use like previously used items mm -hmm. or themes from the past. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a bit about that? Um, so mostly, uh, especially in the multidimensional pieces, what you're looking at are things that people would normally throw away that I save um, and, and, and they collect over time. And also I'm able to mix in my my uh, my drawings is what you see in some of those as well. So I've, I found a way to recycle, which is very important to me. Um, and so that that is basically what you see in my work. And what's the idea of using recyclables? Like, you know, mm -hmm. what, what's, what's your idea of doing that? Why do you recycle those objects? And well, growing, up, you an off -form? growing up, as, growing up um, the Columbus Rec and Parks had a program called Planet Preservers. Um, I think I was maybe 10 or so, maybe a little older, but the program required us to uh, recycle. It was very much a recycle program. So I remember collecting cans and um, cardboard and all, all those type of things. So, and I also, um, in middle school, my seventh grade uh, science fair project was about the environment and the effect of, of plastics in the environment. So it's just always been a part or a passion of mine to, um, I guess, keep my, earthly footprint um, as small as possible, I guess I could say, and just my commitment to reuse. And that's something that is is a theme in my work yeah. or the yeah. transformation as well. So what you see is not what you get. So, and, and that, that also relates to the um, imperfections and the impermanence. You can get beauty from things that are, that would otherwise be thrown away. So you create perfection, a kind of, well, I don't want to call it perfections, but you create beauty 
out of imperfections. Yes. You create beauty out, out of things that have been discarded. Yes. And how was your work a metaphor for the Black experience in America? I believe that, uh, in my opinion, that is the, the gist of Black life. You have to use what you have. You know, and, and historically we've been thrown scraps and that is, that's the most resilient thing about black people, no matter what we have found a way to thrive and survive. So I think me recycling or reusing, or even using found objects in my work, I believe that I'm, I'm basically doing that. I am, I am showing the resilience of black life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah um, I, you wrote and I quote, you said, from slavery to the present, the Black imagination developed techniques, mechanisms, and traditions that make do from scraps. Very, very, very much so. so and I mean, as uh, and hopefully, uh, as moving forward, uh, we have to, we'll, we will have to, I guess, lessen um, the idea of using what you got um, or that or using what you got becomes richer. You know what I mean? So we don't have to keep making beauty out of ashes. Right. I mean, they'll always be they'll, they'll You'll always have to survive the will to survive or even in some instances, again, use what you got, which may be your hands or your brain or, you know, whatever you put in, you know, the books you read or. Um, the classes you take to sharpen your skills, use what you got. So using what you got to get what you want. Yes. So you don't have to keep looking for that illusion as to something that was going to happen. From using what you got, you might get to the next level. Yes. So your work embodies that. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And how do people react when they see you know, used objects being presented as a beautiful work of art. It, 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 it is one of my favorite things to tell people what my work is made out of. Uh, Cause they just, normally they, they can't believe it cause I've transformed it. You would never know unless I tell you. So, and also uh, I enjoy watching people view my work um, as opposed to pictures. Cause, and they always say it's so much different in person. So it, it is, it is, it warms my heart and it's something that, that keeps me inspired uh, when I when I create. Yeah, I know you've talked about the themes that inspires you or that are behind your work. What inspires you to start a particular project? What's the creative process like? Do you envision what it's going to look like from the beginning or do you just let it flow until you get to the destination? I have a general understanding when I start. Um, like I said, it, it generally is based off of a vision or uh, a quote or a Bible verse. So it gives me a good ground, a good foundation to begin to build my work from. Um, so that's basically what the inspiration, where the inspiration comes from. It's, it, it's usually something that I'm very much interacting with at the time. Mm -hmm. I think you call that reconstructing stories to build the future, something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, in regards to building that future, again, going back to using what you got, you know, you kind of have to know where you came from, you know, so using that past to build a better future. So you have a blueprint as to where you're going. So you just follow the line, you told the line through the creative process until you feel like you have arrived at that destination. Right. Okay. And when you, you know, when you feel that, well, this work is complete, what does that feel like? Um, I never really, the funny part about being an artist is you, you, you're so self-critical. Um, and, and that's something that you have to find a way to push through. Um, and again, that's that's kind of what the art therapy certificate enables me to do. Um, so finishing, completing a work um, at the end of that, it just is a very fulfilling uh, uh, experience as if I have been obedient. That's the word I'm looking for. Do you sometimes go back to your work and look at it and be like, wow. Did I make that? 
<laughs> yeah, like especially the the large piece around the way. Uh, and that one's actually at the Streetlight Guild on Main Street right now, um, if you'd like to see it. But uh, every time I see it, uh, I just am like, oh, my gosh, I did that. It does. It does. It does. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine. And what does it feel like, you know, when you are at the gallery and people are looking at your work and they're amazed, then they get to meet you and they their reaction is that you did that? What does it feel like when you get reactions like that, validating your creativity, creativity validating your work? It's most definitely validation. And it, it, it most definitely affirms my place as an artist. Um, so it, it is not it is not an easy thing to accept when people are kind of like, you're Tiffany, because um, I still feel like, you know, I'm still working down at the courthouse and doing art when I get home from my home studio. You know, so it, it is very much, I guess, because it's so common, you know, the life that I live is 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 very much what I do. Um, but from the outside looking in, I can see how it could be impressive and I'm trying to do a better job at accepting that part. It's still it's still very new for me. So you're getting you're getting used to accepting yourself as this artist, this celebrated artist. Yes. Who is now getting in, you know, well, you're shining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I appreciate that. I uh like I said, it's it's been it's been tough to I don't want to say tough, just a just a different. It's just different. Yeah, you know, I can I can relate. I can understand how that feels. Sometimes the attention feels like it's happening to somebody else. Mm -hmm. There's this out of body experience, but yeah. then it's, it's you, right? And it's like, is this real? Is this right. really me? I'm still the same person. Yeah, and but I kind of feel that you. way. The way that things have the doors are opened, and the way that things have just lined up, uh, even from going from Millworks to my home studio, the way that that happened, um, you know, because I, I bought a house so I could work from home because it was too much of a hassle going back and forth from the studio to my apartment that was way on the east side. So I prayed about it and the doors opened. Um, you know, I, I had heard a lot of, um, you know, people talk about how hard it was to purchase a home and it was just so smooth for me. And then from there, that was 2017. From there, just it was show after show. So you know, I can't I can't help but think that that's just favor on my life. That's God's that's God's hand, and I just I, I'm so thankful and grateful for it. So it just everything just continues to flow. You took that pivotal leap of faith, and the universe just aligns in your favor, and it's just like. It deludes your blessings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It kind of just, I pulled the one string and it all unraveled. You know what I mean? So in regards to, even in regards to my creativity, I, I have watched it evolve from the things that I was creating at Millworks. Because I can't say that I, I was I was really committed. I was, but I wasn't exactly sure how how far I could get, you know, with my art. Or if I would ever be accepted with my art. So it just, I took the leap and just, I, I'm so thankful. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm reading this or I'm hearing this to mean like you had, you had to accept yourself first yes. as an artist to accept your creativity. Then others saw that acceptance and then the doors started opening. Absolutely. Because in a way, you know, while I was at um, before before I even moved into the studio space at Millworks, um, I was working at the courthouse and I just I just didn't see what I couldn't see what was next because I definitely wasn't what I, I guess, dreamt of uh, after graduating wasn't being a jud judicial assistant necessarily, you know, so even adapting that mindset. Uh, has been a process. You got to pivot. It's a pivot. And it is a commitment to yourself, again, to want to achieve or even reach for your dreams. I'm sure you can relate. You did it. Yeah. It's just like, you know, I don't know if you read the book, The Alchemist. 
Mm-hmm. Like no one who ever goes in search of their dream, you know, uh, can regret doing that. Right. Once you decide to do that, the universe will just aligns in your favor and things are just that happening. Yes. And prior to that, you might be thinking, what am I doing? What's next? Mm-hmm. How do I get to Mecca? Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. you pull that string and everything just fell everything into place. Everything goes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I try not to get caught up in the what's next. Um, because at this point, like I, I, things just continue to line up. So I, I, even so when I closed the show up at OSU faculty club, I remember bringing all my stuff home. It was still boxed up down in the living room and I'm sitting there like, so what's next? And I had to, I had to get out, get that out of my head. Cause it, it is, it is most definitely paralyzing to try to figure out what the next step is. And you're, you are following by, you know, you're flowing in faith. So it, I definitely had to step out of that. Yeah. You know, God always opens the next door, even mm-hmm. though when you don't even know where that door is, you don't even have to knock. Right. And this time it just opens wide open. Wide open. You just have to walk in. Yeah. And the work you've done in the past will pave way for you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And talking about uh, your display at the Ohio State University, mm-hmm. what did that feel like? And that also put you into the limelight with news coverage here and there. And everyone who didn't know who you were or that you are an artist mm-hmm. now knew who Tiffany Lawson is. Mm-hmm. So what's funny about the OSU faculty club show is I was offered it the year before the year before the pandemic. So it was actually um, postponed as well. So there, there was a blessing in that because I was able to build a whole body of work to show at the OSU Faculty Club. Um, but the prestige of it, um, having known that you only get the show at the OSU Faculty Club if you're alumni. Um, so there's that part of it. Um, and it, it just, it was, it was, it is amazing to think that I've, I, I am in the company of such renowned artists who have also shown at the faculty club. So everything that's, that, that is a bit surreal. Yeah. What was the feeling like seeing, well, you're a mass communicator. So, you know, seeing your name in print and your work being covered by the news. That uh, is still something that I am processing. <laughs> um, but to open the paper and to see a, uh, full page uh, about me uh, is, 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 is humbling, very humbling. It means you're building a legacy. So if, if someone Googles Tiffany Lawson in 100 years, there are records. Yeah. And hopefully I'm, I'm kicking down doors and blazing trails for another, another one to yes. come through in, in a similar fashion. Yes. In your work, Time Capsule, you tackled uh, the dress culture of sagging pants. Yeah. Tell us about this. Um, well, basically, I, I did that because I'm hoping to stop seeing that one day. Um, when I was had the opportunity to work with the middle school kids uh, in, in the school at Arts Impact, I remember asking a couple of the, of the young guys, like, why do you do that? You know what I mean? And they have no clue. I think at this point, it's just something that um, our culture has just kind of accepted and it's getting passed down from one generation to the next with no with no meaning. Like I could understand if if, if you could, you know, ascribe a, a certain meaning to why they sag, but they but they can't. Um, so it's, it's most definitely a time capsule um, for us to have there and somewhere to go forward. Again, a past move into the future. And there, you know, um, a lot of other people in the community have raised those points before. And you have critics pushing back, saying Mm -hmm. that you're criticizing urban Black culture. What do you say to critics that believe that? I mean, it is, it is, there's no negating that it is part of our culture. Um, but that that doesn't mean that it's not something that can't change. 
um, and it, and it, and it is, in a way I'm, I'm also not, um, I'm not knocking the culture because I mean, I grew up on the South side. It's something that I used to do. I used to sag, so I get it. Um, but definitely it's time to evolve. It's just time to evolve. So just because something is cultural doesn't mean it can evolve. Doesn't mean that it can be better. And right. it doesn't mean that it's perfect. Right. And 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 the culture should evolve. Because there's also something that I, I put, there's a statement that I you'll see in my work some from time to time, keep black alive. Because culture is meant to be kept alive. And in order for it to keep alive, it has to evolve. So it has to evolve through time. It has to get better. Right. Right. That should be the goal for it to get better. You know, like we were talking before, um, you know, even using what you got, what you got should get better. And where can people see your work right now if they want to? Right now, um, I've got two pieces shown at the Bexley Library in their rerouted exhibition. Um, the one piece is called, uh, that's the Grace and Mercy. And then the other piece is called Bus Stop Bop. So it's very two different styles that I do that they have there. Um, the Grace and Mercy is most definitely um, multidimensional. Um, and Bus Stop Bop is a, is a one-dimensional piece. Um, and then I have the large uh, Around the Way USA, which is my commentary on gentrification. Um, and it's showing at the Streetlight Guild on Main Street um, right now. Are your works for sale? Uh, yes, the works are for sale. Okay. Where can people buy them? Well, my website goes live next month. And so everything will be on the website. Okay. Do you have the domain name? No, not yet. Okay. But for now, all everything that I have can be viewed on my Instagram, which is at 100M underscore art underscore studio. At 100? 100M underscore art underscore studio. Instagram. Yes. Well, no, no S on the art. No S in the art. Mm -hmm. And so that, if if you go to my Instagram, um, I've got everything that I've worked on thus far, um, a bit of information about some of my exhibitions there, um, and just, I guess, uh, inside, backstage, kind of pass into what I do, uh, you know, works in progress and whatnot. Yeah. Thank you. And... What does it mean, you know, to you to be on this show to educate the public about your work? It's an honor. I appreciate it very much. Um, and I'm also I'm also proud uh, because it is it is very much an affirmation, validation for me that I have developed the language to speak about my own work. Um, so I thank you for letting me do that here. And thank you for coming on the show and using that language to explain your work. It's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. And I wish you the best as you evolve. And I'm looking forward to going to the Columbus Museum of Art to see your work being displayed there and in other places. That is most definitely a goal. But for now, in November, I'll be showing at Sean Christopher in the Short North. So just got to continue to build, uh, build this, this thing as I'm going. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you uh, for coming on the show again. And for those of you who are watching us either on YouTube or Facebook or any other medium, and for those who are listening to this as a podcast, we thank you for your time. And until next time, stay blessed. Bye for now.